Okay, so we are on to our second attachment that we're going to talk about concerning the AA, and this is something called cold vapor. All right, so just like before with graphite, we have an abbreviation for cold vapor. And what we use is a CVAAS. And sometimes the S is left off, and that's understood to be a spectrophotometer, and this is called cold vapor atomic absorption. So cold vapor. All right, so with the cold vapor, what you have to understand is that this typically is a method that's only used for heavy metals. Now, there's an assortment of heavy metals that are out there that we could modify a cold vapor um, and use that method to analyze that particular metal on. However, the one that's notorious for cold vapor is the one and only mercury. That is really where we see cold vapor take its stand in the laboratory. It is with a mercury analysis. Okay, so almost every single time that I analyze mercury, I'm going to have to have a mercury standalone analyzer or a modification of that and that's a cold vapor attachment onto an AA instrument. All right, so how is this thing set up? Well, you still need a light source, and that light source would be a mercury. Uh, the sample chamber normally here is a burner with a flame, so we'll talk about this in just a second. And then over on this side, we have a detector that sees everything that comes in and out of the machine. We also have a sample tube, and this sample tube is through a capillary. We didn't draw this in the graphite furnace because, quite honestly, there was nothing special about it. But this is really where the cold vapor attachment comes in. So this nebulizer tube, or nebulizer capillary, is what sucked my sample up into the flame for it to be presented and for it to be analyzed. All right, well, it's this piece here that really is different when it concerns cold vapor AA. It's the sample compartment chamber. So in a traditional cold vapor attachment, what you would see is a huge box that sits out in front, and this box will have some type of wheel on it or a pump, and that pump will turn over and over and over and over. And it's pumping two solutions through this box. And these two solutions will typically sit over here to the side of the machine. And we have to make sure that those two solutions are constantly filled. We'll talk about what these solutions are in just a second. So these two solutions are pumped through. Uh, and they get pumped around the pump, and they get sucked up with my sample. So there's going to be probably a small platform that sits out here in front, and this small platform is what will hold my beaker with my sample in it that contains the mercury. All right, so I'll draw that sample blue, and there's a sample tube that comes from it as well. So these three kind of converge, and they go into a mixing chamber. And finally, the mixing chamber is hooked up to the traditional nebulizer tube, and that gets pumped in to where the burner head would be. So that's the first thing that I have to maybe make you aware of when it concerns the cold vapor attachment. This really is an attachment that goes on to the front of the machine traditionally, and this attachment is quite large. It takes two containers of solution for this thing to work. It has to be able to hold the sample that you want to analyze as well. It has to have a mixing chamber where all of these things go into and they mix together and then that has to feed that particular sample to the instrument one by one 
by one. So if you've got 30 samples to run, then you're going to have to do this with all 30 samples before it goes into the machine to get analyzed. All right, so the cold vapor attachment traditionally would look something like this. This is what sits on the front of our Varian instrument, and it's also what would sit on the front of many other AA instruments as well. And you can kind of see the pieces and parts here. So here, uh, maybe the more front view of the attachment itself, I see a bar. And there's a space in front of the bar. And that space is meant for you to put your sample down. So that way you don't get them confused with each other. So here is my sample intake. And I have a tube that goes down into that sample. And that tube will suck up that sample that should maybe contain mercury into the mixing chamber. <coughs> Excuse me. Uh, back here behind the bar, you see a couple of other containers. Here's another volumetric um, uh, flask. And then behind that volumetric flask, it might be hard to see for you, but there is a kind of a white, clear, opaque looking um, jug with a screw cap. And this also contains a solution. So they're just kind of give you an idea of what maybe can be used for this. So there's two solutions back here. There's a tube that goes into each one of those solutions. Those solutions get sucked up. Here's the pump that does all of the pumping. So you want to make sure that your tubes are pretty taut against the pump. If they get loose, they won't suck up the sample. And this is sucking the sample and your solvents up, and it goes into the mixing chamber itself. All right. Uh, here's the attachment, the same attachment really that this one is up here to the top left. Uh, that same attachment is over here to the right and that gets put onto the front of the machine. So it's as simple as that. That is what the attachment looks like. If we want it to look more of a schematic, uh, here we see kind of the pieces and the parts that are identified and labeled. Uh, here are the rollers. That's where my pump is located. And I want to make sure that my tubing goes around that pump and that it's pulled pretty tight because if it's not, it will not pump solution around and out. Uh, I see three plastic tubes up here, one that goes into my sample, and one that goes into an acid, and one that goes into what we call a reductant. And those three are all uh, a necessity for the AA to properly work when it concerns cold vapor. So all of my three samples get sucked up, they go around the pump, the tubing takes them around the pump, and then it finally takes them into the mixing area, and that's here, off to the side, and then they eventually go into what we call the gas and liquid separator. So the liquid will basically get dumped out because we don't want to measure the liquid, we are freeing up the mercury, just like we have with any other metal, and we're presenting the mercury into the machine. And then finally, the vapor gets sent out into the burner head area uh, that we'll see. All right, so overall, this is kind of a closer view of the cold vapor attachment. Uh, there's a couple of things on here that I didn't talk about, like a drip tray. Well, that's just to prevent any solution from falling down into the floor. Uh, we also have a hose because this thing requires an extra gas, it, not just acetylene and nitrous, but this requires argon to work as well. Um, and then we uh, see some other kind of uh, silly kind of stuff listed that we don't need to really talk about. The drainage tube is actually here below the gas liquid separator and the drainage tube drains into this area and then there's a drain tube that sits below this attachment to get rid of all of the uh, stuff that will come along with the cold vapor. All right. Okay, so CVAA cold vapor atomic absorption. We know that there is a mixing attachment that sits in front. It takes three solutions one which is your sample and it mixes all three and it sends it into the machine 
All right, some other things about the cold vapor that you should know. Number one, we really focus with mercury here. Mercury is the, the metal of choice when it concerns cold vapor. That's traditionally the most common thing that's measured with it. And the whole purpose of cold vapor is that it takes this mercury ion, and the mercury ion has to be converted to the mercury atom. And this requires reducing the charge. We need to bring it down, right? It needs to go from a plus 2 to a plus 1 to a 0. There's no charge on this mercury here, right? So think about your bank account. You had $2 in the bank, and we're going to reduce that money to 0. We're going to cancel everything out. So if you look at the diagram of the cold vapor, that's why you see the word reductant here, because its job is to reduce the charge on the mercury. Now, in order to do this, we have to free the mercury up, and nitric and sulfuric acid is basically used for this purpose. You also can use hydrochloric acid. If your cold vapor attachment is made for hydrochloric and it works better with hydrochloric you just got to make sure that you're pairing it up with the right reductant so as long as you're pairing it up with the correct reductant then you're good to go so nitric sulfuric or hydrochloric is okay with the freeing up of the acid so if i flip back to the diagram that's why you see the word acid that sits right here at this tube because it's sucking up nitric, sulfuric, or hydrochloric into the mixing chamber. Okay? All right, so after the acid frees it up, we're then going to reduce that freed up mercury with a reductant. And that reductant is 10 to chloride. All right, and that's pretty important. That's kind of standard in a way. There's a couple of other options that are out there, but 10,2 chloride or stannous chloride is the reductant of choice most of the time. Okay, so stannic with an IC chloride is a 10,4, and that's not the version that you need. You need 10,2 chloride. So 10,2 chloride is the reductant. And 10,2 is also called stannous chloride. You can see this either way. And 10,2 chloride or stannous chloride will be basically made into a solution. And that solution will sit over here in one of these jars or containers and will be sucked up by the cold vapor attachment. All right. The problem here is that stannous chloride, there's a couple of things that you have to keep in mind on the prep, okay? And we'll talk about some of these when you come into the lab and when you do it, if you do it for the first time, but stannous 2 chloride can be quite stubborn. Uh, we have to make it dissolve. We have to ensure that it all gets fully dissolved to a certain concentration within a window. And very often, this takes a little bit of work in order to get this to happen. So there's a few tricks up our sleeve that we do when it concerns the stannous chloride prep. And we'll tell you about those when you come into the lab and if you get to run a cold vapor attachment. All right, so that's my reductant. And that is getting mixed with one of the three acids that we talked about a while ago. And then that reaction will give me mercury that will then be presented into the sample compartment. All right, now the problem here is that the sample compartment we're going to have to control. Uh, we just can't pump it into the window that has the burner head and the flame, right? This is not going to work. This is too open. We need to control the flow of the mercury a little bit better. So I'm going to erase the flame here, and what we have here instead of a burner head is basically a piece of glassware. And that piece of glassware will have a glass stem that points out toward the front, 
and it will have a tunnel, basically, that the Mercury will go through. This will be kind of cylindrical. And there we go. All right. So the Mercury actually gets presented into this tube from this front piece. And that delivers the Mercury into this glass tube. And this glass tube will keep my Mercury in a location so that way I can read it after a certain point. These tubes are somewhat opened at the end and that opening allows the Mercury to basically be exhausted and be sucked up and out of the machine eventually. You don't want a build up of the Mercury on the inside because that defeats the purpose. You can't have that happen, right? What would happen is that the Mercury would be sealed off and closed and the mercury atoms would continue to get more and more concentrated here and that defeats the purpose because you're trying to measure how much mercury is in the sample and unless you allow it to flow in and out in a steady stream you'll have nothing to compare it to the only thing that you're doing is making that closed container more concentrated as time goes on and if you ran it initially and if you ran it five minutes later or three minutes later or one minute later you're going to get a different absorbance value because of that so with that said you're still pumping mercury vapor out into the air all right but it's cold vapor and cold vapor basically means it doesn't need a burner head in order to do its job uh, the mercury is measured at 253.7 that is the primary wavelength for mercury. That is the most sensitive area for mercury. And we can go down to a part per billion level with the mercury cold vapor attachment. Part per billion is pretty low. We're always very excited and happy when we can go that low on an atom or a molecule. Part per billion. Now, the Chemtech Lab does have a cold vapor attachment. We rarely use it because we really don't want you playing around with mercury all the time. That's due to a safety hazard. But we do have the technology, we do have the capability in order to run an analyze for mercury on a cold vapor. All right, so that's the cold vapor attachment. Uh, I think we've talked enough about it. We've looked at a couple of diagrams and we've looked at a couple of pictures. So I think that you're comfortable with what this attachment does and uh, why someone would maybe need this type of attachment in their laboratory. So in the next video, we'll talk about an ICP. I know I promised you that in the previous video, but honestly, truthfully now, we're going to get to it. So in the next video, we'll talk about the ICP system. And then after that, we're pretty much finished with atomic absorption.